Hi y'all and welcome back to Professor Trulove's Concepts for Nurses series and this is Professor Terry Trulove. And in this episode, part of the respiratory series, we will be looking at lower respiratory infections including pneumonia, SARS, and TB. Sources for this episode include Iggy's Medical Surgical Nursing and Soul's Introduction to Critical Care Nursing. Pneumonia is defined as excess fluid in the lungs from an inflammatory process. This can severely reduce gas exchange. The sources of inflammation can be triggered by infectious organisms, inhaling irritating agents, and therefore inflammation occurs within the interstitial spaces, around the alveoli, and often in the bronchioles. The pneumonia can occur as lobar pneumonia with consolidation or it can be defined as bronchopneumonia with diffuse scattered patches around all of the bronchi. Pneumonia can be brought out by organisms from the environment, particularly after natural disasters, devices, equipment supplies, and other people. Risk factors include bacteria, viruses, mycoplasma, fungi, rickettsiae, protozoa, and helminths or worms. Non-infectious causes include inhalation of toxic gases, chemical fumes, smoke and aspiration of water, food, even saliva, and vomitus. Further, pneumonia can be categorized as community-acquired, hospital-acquired, or healthcare-acquired, and even ventilator-acquired. Ventilator-acquired pneumonia occurs with the presence of an endotracheal tube, and it usually occurs within 24 to 72 hours after intubation. The way to reduce ventilator-acquired pneumonia includes the use of ventilator bundles, which includes hand hygiene, oral care, and the head of the bed being elevated at least 30 degrees. Diagnostic assessment of all pneumonias, but particularly ventilator-acquired or hospital-acquired pneumonias, include identifying the organism by gram stain, culture, and sensitivity obtaining a complete blood count to determine the patient's immune response, arterial blood gases to determine gas exchange, and electrolytes including blood, urea, nitrogen, and creatinine to determine the patient's fluid status and renal status. Chest x-ray is still an excellent way to determine the extent and the presence of pneumonia, as are pulse oximetry to be able to trend oxygen status, Transtracheal aspiration, which uses a needle to obtain sputum samples through the cricoid process, and even a bronchoscopy, an endoscopic tool that goes within the bronchus to not only observe the airways, but to remove or lavage as necessary. Community-based care for the pneumonias really does center around a vaccination, particularly for those adults older than 65 and those of people with chronic health problems. These folks should be strongly suggested to obtain the pneumococcal pneumonia vaccines. And these resources are generally available system-wide. Other teaching points include avoiding crowded public areas during the flu and holiday seasons, avoiding smoke, dust, and other irritants, making sure to get plenty of rest, sleep, proper diet, and fluid intake, and following up frequently with their private health care provider. Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, was very scary a few years ago and can be linked in with MERS, another type of coronavirus. These are virus infections of a respiratory tract. They trigger an inflammatory response. They are highly contagious, and there are no known effective treatments. The most effective way to combat these coronaviruses are to prevent the spread of the infection by maintaining strict airborne isolation and proper hand washing techniques. Treatment is managing gas exchange issues and helping the student to support themselves as their body fights off this infection. Pulmonary tuberculosis, or TB, is a highly communicable disease caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is transmitted via aerosolization. Patients usually do not develop severe symptoms until the disease progresses to secondary TB. 
the incidence of secondary TB has increased since the onset of the HIV crisis. So to review, while primary TB is usually asymptomatic, the reactivation phase or secondary TB often requires direct treatment. Symptoms that are consistent with TB include progressive fatigue, lethargy, nausea, anorexia, weight loss, irregular menses, low-grade fever, night sweats, cough, micropurulent sputum, and blood streaks. And the cough with blood streaked and purulent sputum has been one of the hallmarks of TB for years, as is the night sweats. The patient most at risk for TB is the patient who is already immunocompromised with other, some other disease. Therefore, do a thorough history on their condition and their living conditions. It is also known that crowded living conditions encourage the incidence of tuberculosis. Physical assessments should show not only the typical signs of tuberculosis, but also signs of malnourishment as people with TB are often malnourished. Recall that the onset of TB is generally quite slow. Diagnosis of TB is done through the manifestation of the signs and symptoms, the NNA test for which results are available within two hours, a sputum smear for acid fast bacillus, sputum culture for M tuberculosis, the tuberculin that is the Mantu test, the PPD is given intradermally in forearm, and we're looking for an induration of 10 millimeters or greater diameter. This means that the patient has been exposed to the TB bacteria. Although there is a resistant strand of TB that is now in the world, combination drug therapy with strict adherence to the regimen still remains very effective for traditional TB. They include isoniside, rifampin, irazidamide, and ethambutol. The goal is to maintain or get to a negative sputum culture. At that point, the patient is no longer infectious. Self-care management must include that the strict adherence to the antibiotics is necessary to remove the danger of this disease. In addition, proper hand hygiene and even self-isolation, that is, staying away from crowded areas, are excellent teaching points and resources for proper nutrition and managing symptoms, including the fatigue, should be sought out. A lung abscess is a purulent or pus-filled area which has replaced healthy lung tissue, therefore is a localized area of lung destruction. It is caused by a liquefaction necrosis, usually related to a pyogenic bacteria. It manifests itself as pleuritic chest pain, Interventions include antibiotics, drainage of abscess up to and including the placement of a chest tube, and frequent mouth care for candida. Inhalation anthrax has not been seen for quite some time, and it was used as a bioterrorist weapon. It is a bacterial infection caused by bacillus anthracis from contaminated soils. The fatality rate is 100% if left untreated. There are two stages, the prodromal stage and the fulminant stage. However, if treated in the prodromal stage with ciproflaxin, doxycycline, or amoxicillin, the patient should fully recover. Empyema is another type of infection, in this case an infection of the pleural space. The most common cause are pulmonary infections, lug lung abscesses, and an infected pleural effusion. Interventions are to empty the empyema cavity by instilling a chest tube, re-expanding the lung, and controlling infection through the use of proper hygiene and antibiotics. And that does conclude this episode. However, there are more episodes in the respiratory collection. I hope you learned a little bit listening. I hope you plan on coming back and listening to some more. And if you are, we'll see you then. Thanks for listening and take care.